recording. All right, well, hello everyone. Thank you all for coming. Um, tonight we have the priv privilege of hearing from Dr. Edgy and she's going to be speaking about combating COVID-19 vaccine hesitancy. As you all should know from your reading, there's a lot of surprising and interesting data about the distribution and administration of the COVID-19 vaccine. As you saw in the article, different racial and ethnic groups do not all share the same excitement to get vaccinated. Some of the factors, but not all, that have contributed to this vaccine hesitancy have arisen from problems in health equity, cases of medical racism in the past and present, lack of information in certain areas, and spread of misinformation as well. Tonight, Dr. Edgy will explain some of these problems and what is being done to help solve them. Dr. Edgy is the Associate Dean of Graduate Medical Education at the University of Cincinnati College of Medicine. She first attended Michigan State University at the age of 16 and received a Bachelor of Science in Physiology. She then proceeded to attend the University of Michigan Medical School and later went on to complete her residency at the Toledo Hospital of Family Medicine. She eventually returned to the University of Michigan to obtain a Master's in Health Professions Education. Dr. Edgy has been an active member and leader within the Cincinnati community for a long time. Recently, she's been encouraging minorities to get vaccinated and even enrolled herself in a vaccine trial. Thank you so much, Dr. Edgy, for coming tonight and leading our class in a discussion about combating COVID-19 vaccine hesitancy. The floor is all yours. My goodness, first of all, thank you so much for the invitation. I'm thrilled to be here. Um, what I'm gonna do is to go ahead and um, cut off my video while I'm presenting just so that we've got good bandwidth and no technical issues. Um, and I will share my screen in just a second. Can you see that? Yes, we can. Okay. And Okay. So we're going to go ahead and get started. First of all, um glad to be here. Very excited about it. Um I actually can you get my camera off from your end or no? Yes, I can actually try. Okay, give it a try. I just don't want to trouble, you know, trouble in between. Oh, I'm moving forward. All right, can um, let's end show for a second. I'm gonna. There we go. I I just you got uh, it? stopped your video. Yep. Okay. Okay, and you're still seeing my screen. Correct. Okay, let's go on then. All right, so um, thank you for the introduction. I'm Michigan grad, double alumna, and program director, and actually very excited about today being Match Day in particular because um, we did really well at UCMC. We matched every single program slot except for one out of all of our almost 100 programs. Um, anyway, DIO, I've been here for about a year and a half here in Cincinnati and just really excited to be involved in my, my style really to just dive in um, the deep end <laughs> typically and coming in right at the top of COVID was really an opportunity to, to be involved with a lot of different things and meet a lot of different people. Um, objectives of our, our meeting today, number one, is to differentiate equality from equity. And that's actually very important in this um, hesitancy discussion, because one of the things that we find with vaccine hesitancy is that we must address that to get to um, equity. And we'll talk about it just a little bit, clarify that for you. We also do wanna be familiar with some past and present causes of vaccine hesitancy. So we'll review a couple of specific um, cases. And then also to understand the importance of catalytic partnerships and specifically relationships in combating vaccine hesitancy. So equality versus equity. And the simplest way to deal with this in the context of vaccines is that if you were to say that we were having equality, then that would be free vaccines for all, which is exactly what we have. The problem is that we don't wanna just do that. We actually wanna make sure that everyone becomes vaccinated. So really um, equity is outcomes oriented. And so for that to occur, we have to deal with the history and the hesitancy in particular, because there are barriers um, where individuals are really, um, right as we speak, rejecting life-saving vaccines because of history. Um, also, we have to deal with things like access and not just vehicular access. Um, you can imagine that, you know, we were thrilled to have drive-through clinics here at UC, but for individuals who just don't have a way to get, um, you know, 
maybe they use public transportation. That's really actually not anything convenient for them at all. And so luckily just um, this past week, we've actually had um, walk-in clinics here at UCGNI. So people can just walk in and get their vaccine. There are other things that can be barriers, um, not having enough time off work. We'll talk a little bit about that down the line. But again, ultimately, the goal is to have um, everyone vaccinated as opposed to free vaccines for all. So a subtle difference, I'll stop any any questions down the line, please just go ahead and pipe up. Um, I can't see the chat, so let me know, um, Raul, if there are questions. But so equality, everyone gets the same thing, but equity is really making sure that the outcomes are the same. So what is health equity? The issue here is that number one, we need optimal health for all people. And that's really one of the foundations, but there are three different, um, three different principles that actually stand underneath this. Again, valuing every individual and population as equal, recognizing historic injustices, and providing resources according to need. Um, health disparities will be eliminated when we achieve health equity. And again, that's the importance of dealing with the hesitancy that deals with equity that deals then with health disparities and ultimately changes um, the outcome. Uh, this right here, one of the most important ones is talking about Tuskegee. And this is a situation whereby um, people were approached. There were 623 men in Tuskegee, Alabama. They were approached by people they trusted, specifically um, there are faith leaders, community service personnel, medical personnel, so even physicians were approaching them to provide them with free medical care and free meals. They all had syphilis. And basically, in fact, the physicians were actually um, sent a letter. The physicians in the community were sent a letter stating that if any of these gentlemen come to your um, clinic for any sort of care, deny them care. I mean, this is, can you imagine just practicing in a situation whereby you're given that information? It wasn't until 1940, um, I'm, it was, that was back in 1932. It wasn't until 1972 um, that the Washington Star News published an article exposing the fact that these gentlemen, despite the fact that penicillin had been found to be um, curative for syphilis, that it had been withheld from the men so they could see the natural progression of disease. And this is the foundation of just one of the building blocks of hesitancy and distrust. And um, again, this was a U.S. Um, po um, public health service that did this, and they utilized people that be, um, that people were meant to trust as their um, message uh, messengers. So this was a significant issue. Now I'm going to ask you to go ahead, and the brave person out there can unmute their phone. I mean uh, their um, their their web, and just let me know what you think is going on with this woman. What are her emotions that she's expressing? Describe to me what you see you were to go ahead and present this patient, what do you see? There's gotta be a brave soul out there. Tell me what you see. Well, I would say she looks uh, like she might be a little concerned uh, or even confused, uh, maybe not really sure what's kind of going on around her. Mm -hmm. So what, what age would you say she looks and just a description of her, if you were just to start a presentation and say, this is a... Uh, I, uh, it really could be a, a pretty wide range. Um, this is a safe space. Maybe like uh, 30s, 40s. Okay. All right. So you'd say maybe 30s, 40s, um, black female, looks like she's in some distress, some anxiety, wearing oxygen, laying in a hospital bed. About right? So one thing that we do know, does anyone know who she is? Okay, so hearing none, I'm gonna advance the slide. So this lady is actually Dr. Susan Moore. She is uh, an alum of Michigan. She came from my med school. She is a woman who is actually 52 years old um, in this picture um, on the left. And um, she actually was diagnosed with COVID-19 um, on November 29th. She was admitted to a hospital um, in Indiana, Indiana University Hospitals. 
and uh, had significant pain related to COVID. She had significant shortness of breath. She was diagnosed with pneumonia, although she professed that the doctor actually didn't listen to her lungs at all, despite you know the findings on the x-ray. And uh, she was very stressed. She was feeling like she was not getting the care she should have gotten. She obviously articulate woman. Um, and uh, she, she actually got so distressed, she ended up posting on social media that she just didn't feel like she was getting the care she deserved. And um, that she, you know, again, he wasn't even listening to her lungs. Um, the nurses seemed to be intimidated. She ended up staying in the hospital um, until December 9th and then was discharged to home. Now, our son there in the middle picture, his name is um, Henry. He's 19 years old. He took her home. She said to him for um, a full 12 hours, and then he rushed her back to another hospital. Um, at that time, when she was admitted, her temp was 103. Her blood pressure was 80 over 60. And she was subsequently um, ventilated, and she died of COVID on December 20th. Um, the CEO's response um, when this occurred was, quote, the nurses may have been intimidated by a, a knowledgeable patient who was using social media to voice concerns and critique. And um, so this is a situation that was very big in social media. Um, again, she had posted her video from the hospital bed, being very concerned about the care she was getting, knowing full well what a full exam is, a full lung exam, a full everything, and she was just not getting the care. Um, but these are stories, this is recent. Tuskegee was, was remote. Um, but these are stories that are fueling vaccine hesitancy. And specifically, this is information out of um, the NAACP did, did this um, survey of Black and Latinx individuals and found that Black and Latinx individuals specifically are disproportionately affected by the pandemic, but this, and, and specifically that they know, especially Black Americans, 55% of them know somebody who's been diagnosed. And then um, amongst Latinx Americans, 73% know somebody who's been diagnosed with COVID, and then um, 48 and 52 um, have died. So disproportionately high rate, as you already know from previous lectures. Despite that, the trust is extreme is extremely low. And so trust in the, um, the vaccine, down in the 14% for Black Americans and 34% in Latinx Americans, that has been shifting as we'll see through the lecture. But the trust in its effectiveness also down um, below what you'd expect. And there's concern that, quote, they didn't test it on any of us. And you can understand just the the um, the difficulty with thinking, wow, should I get tested? Should I not? This is what happened in a remote situation um, with vaccines in the past. We were we were denied them. So you know, again, that's informing some of the decisions. As far as vaccine hesitancy and various people um, that they trust, Fauci, of course, is at the top um, for both groups. Um, the FDA below that, pharmacies and clinics, drug companies lower, and of course, um, the administration at the time also lower. Um, vaccine hesitancy also, um, we found that the best messengers tend to be from individuals who look like them. And so again, this speaks to the issue of how deeply um, the fact that we had community leaders go out and, and really tell the physicians don't don't go ahead and, and treat these men with syphilis way back in the past. So, um, and then trust in healthcare provider actually is very, very high still, which is helpful. Um, as far as black community effectiveness of the um, vaccine uptake, again, as you see historic data down here, knowledge of the Tuskegee syphilis study is a negative predictor of vaccine uptake, as you'd expect. We also see here that um, two thirds of patients who are black do not trust that the government can be um, trusted to look after their own interests. Um, and these are very sad things, especially when we've got something again that is well tested, beautiful uh, results on efficacy uh, and also effectiveness now that we have it out in the general population um, of um, the mRNA vaccines and also the um, non-replicating viral vector of J&J. So this started to affect me when I had the death of my stepmother. She died in August. She was she was young, healthy, and over the course of eight days, she she rapidly succumbed to COVID. And it was really um, really heart wrenching for me, and actually kicked me into action. And we'll explain part of the rest of the things that I've done um, since um, since then. But this is a, a a poem that was just written out of I don't know the grief of the situation. Dear time. If the death of a loved one who died of COVID was a teardrop in the pool of life, then surely its ripples are the effects on survivors. 
Wrong. Ripple is too gentle a term. No, it's a massive wave, not a ripple. It does not come slowly or gently. It's a tsunami suddenly looming above you, surrounding you in the menacing shadow of its profound darkness as it comes crashing down on a previously peaceful, sun-drenched shore, leaving in its wake a debris of incredible sadness for daughters and sons, sisters and brothers, mothers, fathers, husbands, wives, a debris of profound helplessness to provide comfort to those hardest hit, a debris of lost dreams, unfinished plans, and truncated conversation, a debris of bitterness for the infectivity of misinformation and the willingness to deny its very existence. How is this thunder and lightning of this storm not heard and not seen? How is the ice cold chill of this wave not felt in the, in the very bones of all who know? It has already crashed on 400,000 shores. It will come again and again, crashing thunderously onto another peaceful, unsuspecting shore, wreaking its havoc, leaving its piles of debris and moving on. My plea to time, make a generous and swift donation into the calendar of life and fast forward to a point when science has had a chance to hone its craft and healing has started to emerge into a sunshine of a brighter future. And so this, again, it catapulted me knowing that here at UC, we had um, the Moderna trial and we were one of 90 participating sites. And so I went ahead and I enrolled um, and was randomized to either placebo or to um, the vaccine. And I, I got my first shot September um, 12th, my second one October 14th. And the second one I felt, it was uh, certainly more reactogenic as you already know, um, I felt my left arm was a lead balloon. Um, and so I immediately figured I must have gotten the shot because there's no way normal setting would do that for me. But what it did is it started three, three relationships and I'll talk about each one of them. The clinical trial team, I got to see how Dr. Fichtenbaum had actually done a really great job um, forming the team. Um, we'll talk, talk about local organization that we got involved in and then uh, organized medicine, how that catapulted things as well. So as far as the clinical trial team, internally, um, Dr. Fickenbaum actually hired black, brown, and bilingual clinical trial researchers so that um, people who would come back and, you know, who've been enrolled could come back and, and speak to people that looked like them and also were able to go back into the communities and help convince other people, hey, I'm doing well, um, join in the trial. So not only did that find, you know, form the base infrastructure for a robust study enrollment of trial participants who actually reflected the, the number in the community, but it also allowed us to go ahead and when it came time to, um, to start inoculating people, we were able to find the blind spots in our community landscape and find the individuals who didn't have the cars and didn't have, you know, some of the other resources to try and get in to get their, um, their shots done. Of note here as well, um, the percentage of um, people who are Black and Latinx in our trial site mirrored the general population, which was something very important. In fact, Moderna did go ahead and, and um, not halt, but um, did go ahead and change their enrollment to go ahead and increase the numbers um, in the last several stages there of uh, Black and Latinx patients. Externally, um, he did go ahead and partner with key organizations. So um, the Cincinnati Medical Association is a Black association of physicians here in town. And Dr. Fickenbaum came and spoke about all the details of the trial so that when we spoke to our patients, we were able to go ahead and give them granular detail on, on every stage of, um, you know, all of the phases and everything else that was going on. And we do know that this is a, an effective strategy because um, we found that there's a very high percentage, as we noted in the study just now, the survey um, that Latinx and Black patients um, do um, take well to information received from a physician who looks like them. So as far as local community organizations, there is one here called Closing the Health Gap. They do a phenomenal job. And as you can suspect, their job is really um, to close the gap in health disparities in Black communities and specifically here in, in Cincinnati. And so what they've done is they've held 30 virtual forums since the beginning of the pandemic. And they are very um, specific um, on when they're held. They're held every other Saturday from 4 to 5 p.m., Facebook Live, same address, same everything. And so what that has done is they've actually um, sequestered experts um, in the field, uh, ID folks, they've also um, picked um, people who have, um, who are celebrities in town, et cetera, et cetera, and, um, to go ahead and speak on um, these different, um, the benefits of going ahead and getting vaccinated. Um, they start off with acknowledging the hor horrific truths, 
dispelling myths. Um, there are some amazing things that I've heard over time, um, having to explain to patients that there's absolutely no preservative in it, um, you know, that uh, the mRNA has no access to the DNA, which is, quote, locked in um, a lockbox, you know, the nucleus, and so on and so forth, um, trying to dispel some of those and combat some misinformation. And then just doing what we do regularly as physicians, translating complex science into simple facts and, um, you know, just trying to explain, you know, what mRNA is. Um, the, the thing that has been very important about this is that it's the same time, same place in two weeks strategy. So we know that um, building trust is not something that happens in a single um, discussion or interaction, um, but usually it's an iterative experience so that we've noticed that people have moved, they've come back several times and they're getting closer and closer and closer to saying, okay, yep, I can go ahead and do this. And um, so the stability of its occurrence is its own reassurance. And I'll just say that again, the stability of its occurrence is its own reassurance. Um, so having a, a place that they can go back to and dip back into that well. This is just one example. Um, and again, really a variety of different people who've been involved with, um, with this. And the main issue here is to go ahead and figure out, so Ebony J, who is her demographic that she has listening? She has several um, thousand people who listen to her several times a day. Um, but that has been one way, to, again, to make sure that we go ahead and get everyone involved. Um, the, last, the last of the three different um, areas would be um, organized medicine. And so I'm an AMM a member, I've been very active, um, really involved also with our um, student group here. Um, but they did a tiny story about the fact that I was in the mRNA trial. They tweeted that out. And um, the next thing you know, NPR and Lincoln Ware Show and all these other places had all of a sudden picked up and they wanted to talk. And most recently, I just did a national strategy for COVID-19 responsiveness, which was a national forum um, that was done by the uh, Biden-Harris administration. And that was very rewarding because we actually had 13,000 people, and I'll discuss that in a bit. But this is a note, and this may seem like anecdote, but it's not. This is a note that I received from a faculty member here at University of Cincinnati, who actually I don't even know. But she had had a visit. She's an oncologist. She had a visit with one of her patients. And she said, at the conclusion of our telehealth visit, we talked about recommended vaccines included COVID-19. She placed me on speaker so her husband could also hear as I endorsed the use of this vaccine. She then told me that she had originally been opposed to the vaccine, but had heard recently, uh, oh, I'd recently participated in one of the town halls done by Center for Closing the Health Gap. And after hearing Dr. Edgy speak, had changed her mind. She was now excited this is the part that really blows me away, that she was happily able to share some of the long-term data about mRNA vaccine technology she, that she learned from the talk. So again, this is, I think I did four or five of these closing the health gaps, but she had come to several of them and it took that much time for her to, to finally make a decision and pulled her husband into that decision as well and the rest of her family. Um, so really just trying to make um, our job a little bit easier and the discussions that other docs have with their patients also a little bit more um, more relaxed. So this is the one that I was telling you about for um, by the the um, administration. But we had thirteen thousand participants. There were six thousand um, organizations, every state and DC, and one hundred ninety seven tribes that heard from multiple, multiple different people about things that have worked in their area, trying to go ahead and use best practices and, and learn from each other. There's one guy who was in our panel that was wonderful. He spoke about the fact that EMS has access to, you know, every household in any city and that um, equipping them with um, with testing kits and also with vaccine is one way that they're they're working on things in, in Indiana. So. Um, also, um, we have found that Hamilton County has actually done really well. We are the number one, number two county um, in Ohio for um, reaching the African-American population. So these little things that we've been doing over and over and over again in these different situations, like um, closing the health gap, have been making some um, moving the needle, but there's still so much work that needs to be done. Um, so moving people from vaccine hesitant to vaccine hopeful, um, those who are willing to get vaccinated, as we know from Kaiser Family Foundation data, um, for some of the information that you read, back in September, there were 42% of patients, Black and Latinx patients that were saying, yes, I'm going to get vaccinated. And by December, we've gone up to 66, and that has gone higher since then. Um, 
barriers, of course, finding cracks in the system, someone having no physician, how do you get connected, no phone, no internet, no car, no time in the workday to be on hold, waiting to see if you can get in line. And in fact, um, this guy right here, a friend of mine, um, Jerry Abrams, he um, presented at the Senate um, last week, and he's doing something really phenomenal. Any of the barriers that I listed on the last slide, his, his um, entire clinic goes ahead and um, I think they've gotten enough 52,000 vaccines that are put into arms of people who have no access to any of the things that you'd usually expect. You can't speak English, we'll translate it. If you can't register, you can't get online, we'll do it for you. So they've actually put themselves in the space and make sure that, you know, made sure that people have gotten what they need. So there have been partnerships with community leaders here in town, um, Black and Latinx physicians, faith leaders, local businesses, schools, primary care as well. And my grandma here in the very center, she's 97. I, she just got her, her um, first Moderna shot um, a couple of weeks ago. But the issue here is that she's 97. She had been trying since the beginning of the age group. And of course, you know, she's at the top of the age group being 97 to get her vaccine. My mother here, who's got a doctorate and has been on the phone trying to connect her, she still was not able to get her in until several months after she was eligible just because there are no vaccines in the community in, she, in which she lives. So our big thing right now is to keep our eye on the ball. Um, time is a ticking, and specifically when we think about it, I want you to, to tell me how many people do you think traveled over the weekend? Take a wild guess. This past weekend, between Friday night and Saturday night, airplane travel. Oh, there's a brave soul out there. Go for it. I'm just going to take a quick guess and say uh, 15 million. 15 million. You know what? It was 2.5 million. So not as high as what you expected, but you can see people are starting to wake up and feeling, hey, I'm comfortable. I've had my vaccine. They're starting to relax things just a little bit. And I know we've all been pent up and all this other stuff, but one thing that we have to remember is that we have variants. And although we have vaccine candidates that are out there, um, Moderna, Pfizer, and J&J, &J, the Janssen um, vaccine, of course, is viral vector, AstraZeneca also viral vector. Um, and I, I think you've probably already gone over probably the, the technology in the past, but there's no vax as well. But in the meanwhile, we've got these variants. And since you've got some places like Texas, for example, that have been opening up, and there are multiple states that have opened up completely and not wearing masks even, um, that we may start to get a variant that spins out of an area that is uncontrolled um, as a possibility. So really, this is a race against time. The important thing here is to remember that for us to get to 70% herd immunity, we do need to make sure that hesitant communities are immunized as well. Um, one thing I know from the Kaiser Family Foundation data is that, you know, we've spoken specifically about Black and Latinx communities, but um, we have Republican rural individuals who are also and actually at the highest um, um, risk of, of saying, I either don't want it or I'll never get it. Um, so, you know, that's another crew that, that needs to definitely be, um, be addressed. Um, as we look forward as well, and COVID is short term, but when we think about the long term goal with health disparities, it's really making sure that um, our healthcare uh, workforce um, is well equipped to handle situations and to relate to patients as well. Um, so, one of the things that the ACGME is doing, which is our accrediting body um, at the national level, is trying to make sure that milestones are being put into place for residencies where these are criteria that you have to meet as a residency to go ahead and, um, you know, to re remain um, solvent, basically. So level one is really just sort of the bare bones. If your milestone is one, then your program is really not necessarily doing what it needs to be doing. Just acknowledging that diversity is important is not enough. You want to go to five, which is aspirational, where you're actually partnering with the community. There's evidence of that where you're actually working in a very specific situation to um, to address issues. That you're actively working in larger communities uh, toward eliminating um, oppression and health inequities, which we are. Um, and then faculty, residents, and staff reflect the diverse makeup of the community served. That's something that's also being done. 
as far as curricular milestones, again, moving away from just um, looking at the minimum, but moving toward curriculum that actually does include, um, you know, uh, um, anti-racism information, things like what happens with, um, you know, Susan Moore, how do we prevent that from being an issue? Um, we do know that there's a lot of evidence that certain patients do not receive the right amount of pain medication. Sickle cell patients, for example, um, are often denied the maximum um, pain medicine that they would benefit from and so on. Um, and then that we're developing content and serving as a model for a health system related to um, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and that we're engaging community partners again to develop curricular content. Um, again, from the personnel and pipeline and faculty route, we should have diversity of representation with senior management and, and important decision making. Um, we have matchmaking coming up, and we've tried to make sure that um, Mia Mallory is. Um, she is actually involved at the very beginning when we have orientation with our residents. And then also um, she is on a consult um, sort of relationship with residencies as they put in their rank list as well. And then that our program de um, leadership works effectively with institutional leadership to advance um, initiatives of DEI. So objectives were to define and differentiate equity from equality. And of course, um, equity addresses outcomes rather than just parity. And to be able to articulate why addressing vaccine hesitancy is important, vaccine hesitancy deals with the history portion, which helps us to move toward equity, which then helps us to um, move closer to eliminating health um, disparities. And to be familiar with some past and present and, um, present causes of vaccine hesitancy, which we talked about, an old one with Tuskegee and a new one here recently with um, Susan Moore. And then to understand the importance of catalytic relationships and combating vaccine hesitancy. Um, so we talked about the trial team building from the inside out, communicating with um, community leaders that are able to take the message forward in their own spaces, um, and then using your own personal platform um, to be somebody that's accessible um, to deliver the message um, and to help out. So that is all I had. Um, I'm going to stop sharing. And I'm open for any questions. Dr. Edgy, can you see the chat now? You know what? Um, I actually can't. Can you fill the chat? Hang on, let's see if I can pull it up. Yeah, I've got nothing on my chat. Okay, yeah, th th there wasn't. I'm just a lot, just making sure that you can. So students, okay. if you have any questions, please feel free to enter in the chat. Dr. Edgy can answer them directly. Hi, my name's Emily. I have a quick question. Um, one of the communities that you talked about that um, does seem to have a higher hesitancy towards the um, being vaccinated is rural communities. Um, and I was kind of looking into that through the discussion board and some of the things that has was mentioned was potentially that these rural communities were not um, personally affected as um, much as other communities, such as in large cities. Um, so that could potentially be a reason why they are more hesitant. Um, what would be some suggestions that you have um, as to how to target the language that we, um, you know, I have family who lives in rural com communities who would potentially be a part of these people who are more hesitant to receive the vaccine. So just what advice do you have for the language that um, I or other students um, could use to kind of express the importance of um, the vaccination, you know, specifically targeted to this population? Yeah, thank you, Emily. That's a great question. So one thing that I think is important um, at, you know, as I've gone around and spoken to different groups, including, um, you know, the rural populations, um, the biggest thing that I've heard back is that it's a hoax. That's one thing. And the second thing is concern about um, the contents of the vaccine itself. And so a couple of, a couple of things. Um, I know, for example, here in Cincinnati, we have um, 15,000 healthcare workers. Um, that would include EMS as well. And um, letting folks know that 
these individuals, this swath of individuals, all the 1A individuals have actually gotten vaccinated and had no problems. Um, that is one way that um, people have sort of moved that needle forward. The second thing is speaking about, you know, what the ingredients are. There really are three major ingredients, um, you know, in the mRNA vaccines in particular. So you've got the mRNA, which really lasts for about 24 hours. Um, you do have lipid nanoparticle, which is just fat, and then you have some sugar. Those are the three major things. There's no preservative. So I think reassuring people, um, number one, that it isn't causing any harm to the people who've got it. Out of every single trial that had mRNA vaccine, nobody got admitted who got the vaccine and nobody, so with severe COVID and nobody died. So if there's concern about adverse effects, that's one thing, um, you know, equipping yourself with the knowledge there. The other thing is, um, you know, it's, again, it's a hoax has been the biggest, the biggest thing that I've heard in those communities. And it's been very tough to, to demonstrate um, because it's really not necessarily affecting as many of them, I've had 4 family members total who have died. So this is very real to me and I've um, spoken to a lot of people who've had upwards of 10 people involved because they're in that high risk population. And it's difficult if you don't have somebody that, you know, has who has been directly affected. Um, the other population, actually, my daughter is a 22 year old college student in Miami, um, she, you know, Oxford. Is the college population so try, i've been trying to talk to them as well but you know i think dispelling misinformation is the most important thing um it's tough uh, and again it usually requires more than one conversation um it sometimes requires them knowing somebody who's had who's had some some issues um i did speak to um folks in at national children's in dc there are about 300 sickle cell patients their families were calling and asking um, you know, whether they should get it and things like that. Um, and a lot of people, not necessarily who are young thinking or young people, not necessarily thinking they'll be affected, but just letting them know that, yes, we have people at children's hospital here that have been admitted with strokes, um, who are 32 and, and younger. Um, and so, you know, again, relaying that information beyond that, Emily, it's a really tough, it's a tough situation because you know, we're, we believe in science and there are a lot of folks who don't. Um, unfortunately, it got politicized. Um, Thank you. That was awesome. You're welcome, Emily. Um, so you may have said this, but I was wondering if we'll see more um, testing for minority populations with the current and future vaccines. Um, so I don't know who this was. Um, so the question really, you know, are we going to have more African Americans, for example, in the in the the population? Uh, I'm happy to say so. Get this. So Pfizer actually started their vaccine trial, their phase one after we did, and um, Moderna. I say we, Moderna. Um, but if you realize, you remember when the very first vaccine was sort of, you know, being given to, um, you know, our lady there in um, in England, and it was a big deal. You know, first COVID vaccines being given. It was not Moderna, even though we started the trials first. The, they halted things at Moderna to try and make sure that we had the number of people in our vaccine that mirrored the community so that we did not have black and brown patients say, they didn't test it in us, I'm not gonna do it. Um, so, you know, again, trying to get the testing up, I think one of the things I've had to use as a discussion point is explaining what an IRB is, you know? They're like, well, how's, how's Tuskegee not gonna happen again? Well, it's because, there have been other things that have come up. You have to take city training. You have to do all these things to be involved in clinical trials. And you cannot enroll a single human being, you know, and trying to explain um, that to patients, I think, has, has also been helpful. Did I answer that question? I'm not sure that I did. Okay, let me see. There's another question here. What is your advice um, ensuring that people do not view the vaccine as the end of mass wearing and other public health measures? So this is actually a tricky one. Um, as I, the reason I brought up, you know, 1.5 million people traveled by air on Friday and another million on Saturday is because people have sort of, you know, my daughter even said it. She's like, woohoo! This is, I got a text just before this. She's like, woohoo! Graduation in person today. COVID's over. I'm like, no, COVID is not over, Francesca. Um, and so. Just trying to make people understand, um, there are a couple of different things. One, there's a study that came out of Israel two weeks ago, maybe two and a half weeks ago, 
um, there are actually two studies, but one of them specifically looked at um, the fact that Israel is sort of, no, well, let's go, go back for a second. When you are testing how well a vaccine works in a trial, it's called efficacy. When you're testing how well it works in the general population, it's effectiveness. And so what has happened with Israel is that they all really got Pfizer. And so you have got sort of a, a little laboratory there of people at 30, 30% uh, of their population has been immunized um, who are over age 16. And so you've been able to see actually how this is working. And so number one, it all corroborated all the information that was found in the clinical trial phase three. And it also has um, shown that 90% of people who do have um, the, the Pfizer vaccine are not transmitting COVID. I mean, they're not transmitting the virus at all. So um, this issue about now we have a little bit of information about whether this um, this is actually something that protects against transmission is really, really important. Um, now, there are caveats. This is one study. Um, it's one population, you know, and a fairly homogeneous population in some respects as well. And so we just have to make sure that we have, you know, robust um, science to prove that um, again. But that is, I think, going to be making it a little bit more difficult for people to to say, okay, well, um, I, I don't need to wear, you know, a mask anymore. I think it's going to be a, a tough thing. Uh, we've got states as well that are legislating that you don't have to wear a mask. That that is that is problematic. Um, I've been having to deal with graduations in particular, so you know, residents have had a really really tough year, as you guys have as well. And do you have graduation in person, et cetera, et cetera? Um, making sure it's socially distanced, that we're doing the right thing, that there's the right balance. Uh, I am a little bit concerned. I looked just before this, I was on the institutional call and looking at our curve, you know, we're down significantly over what we were before um, almost, um, but we're starting to get a little bit of a bump, um, just a little bit of a bump. And I, I'm just worried just in those next few, three weeks or so, whether we'll be able to make sure the variants don't end up being an issue. So in other words, do you, uh, how do you find you can strike a balance tying the vaccine's effectiveness? Oops. Um, and making sure the public health prices, yeah. Other questions? I was wondering if there are any opportunities for pre-med students to volunteer in town halls or forums? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I can go ahead, um, Renee Mahaffey Harris, I'm on the board for the Closing the Health Gap, and Renee Mahaffey Harris is the CEO. We can certainly use um, any voices that can bring reason to the discussion. Um, we've had a variety of different folks. I, I remember speaking to a group of 18 to 34 year olds, totally different questions than, than patients who are older. Um, so absolutely. I, um, I will go ahead and put my email in the chat and then you can go ahead and touch base with me. Send me an email if you're interested in being involved. Anything else? Hi, Dr. Edgy. I think um, Hannah has a question. Um, her yeah. question is, how, how, would you how would you suggest collaboration between units outside of healthcare, such as legislation, social work, and welfare to directly address and alleviate social determinants of health that have contributed to issues such as vaccine inaccessibility? Honestly, I think um, organized medicine is your best bet. I, um, there are significant, so I'll give an example, just because I've been involved with organized medicine for since I was a medical student. Um, I think for me, I, very early on, I realized that my, um, my time in the room with a patient is extremely important, but I do have an ability to help outside of the patient room as well. And so um, being involved in organized medicine, I found you're able to go ahead and get an idea that's a grassroots idea and go ahead and get, it's like rolling the snowball and you can get people onto your idea and then bring it to a national level, at which point you can have money that's put behind it in, a, in the form of a resolution that gets passed. Then you're in front of Congress, you're doing things that can make a difference. So um, I do suggest kind of getting involved 
figuring out what's going on with the Ohio State Medical Association, since you know, Academy of Medicine of Cincinnati, um, all of these things. What you don't want to do is to do what we call false workload, which is trying to do things that are already being done by somebody else. Um, and you can get involved. You don't want to reinvent the wheel if it's already rolling really well. Um, so, uh, you know, again, you do have a branch here. Um, so medical student region five of the AMA is here. And there is a, a council on science and public health that deals with um, social determinants of health issues and so forth. And again, if you're able to go ahead and get a resolution, an idea you have that, you know, gets decided or thought about, you know, it, you know, on, a, on the back of a napkin while you're sitting at dinner with somebody else, you can go ahead and move that on. And at the at the AMA level, what can happen is you can get money put allocate, you know, get allocated to that. So if it's something that may need legislation, it usually has a fifty thousand dollar minimum, um, and you have to go ahead and make your case and t you know testify that yes, this is something that is worth going forward. And you can get tons of folks on board. And then the resolution gets passed, and there's no option except for the AMA to provide the funding because it passed, um, you know, by a majority vote in the house in the um, AMA House of Delegates, and so that's how certain things are getting are getting done. I think it's the fastest way, um, and I think the neat thing about it too is that you've got multiple specialties that are all bringing in their angles and their information, um, and people who are genuinely interested in seeing the ball move forward. Um, for patients and for the profession. Uh, this is David Wazorek. I thought that was a fantastic talk. I'm wondering, you. are you engaging, and I'm sure you are, but can you tell us a little bit more in terms of the engagement of leaders in the URM communities, such as church leaders, MDs, civic leaders, people in entertainment who are also URMs, in trying to get people to get the vaccine in the various communities? Absolutely. Thank you for the question. Um, so, yes, yeah, so closing the health gap actually has done a great job. They've got 30, like I said, they had 30 different um, things that they've done, um, Facebook lives and things like that. Um, and I'm doing something in three weeks for the um, for this region's uh, AKA, which is, you know, one of the largest sororities, um, black sororities. But what we've done um, is closing the health gap has had, you know, the guy who's a coach for Cincinnati Bengals, um, all these folks that are actually um, community leaders. We've also had um, the African-American physicians who are here at UC, the all of the professors, including Alvin Crawford, for example, and Michael Thomas and um, Lester Dupachan, all been on um, closing the health gap as well. So trying to, everyone sort of knows that's a space that you can go and um, you know have the opportunity. There are other things that we've been trying to do as well as get enduring material. So um, I have um, I've recorded modules for churches in Columbus and done you know Facebook lives for uh, folks in Atlanta and so on to try and make sure that there's some enduring material that can be utilized over and over again um, with very specific points. Um, you know what what is in it? Um, you know how does this affect pregnancy? Well, you know just very simply explaining that. MRNA cannot access the nucleus where, you know, and translating that into simple English is helpful, but um, church leaders, you know, again, um, there has been a, a fair amount of work with closing the health gap specifically to get um, church leaders involved. Um, here at UC, there is actually a vaccine crew, I guess you'd call it, I don't know the, the official term for it, but it's comprised of ID folks, it's comprised of folks like myself who are or find and available, we'll make ourselves available to talk to folks that need a speaker um, on vaccine hesitancy and, um, uh, you know, again, recording modules and things like that, but having a central location so that we're not um, reinventing the wheel. Thank you. Do you think that potentially you could have, let's say for people who have difficulties traveling, can you have, let's mm -hmm. say, let's, um, let's say buses that can take people Absolutely. from the churches to, to the vaccine center and using the, potentially the J&J &J or the Janssen vaccine, which is a one-shot vaccine, so they don't have Absolutely. to keep coming back and forth. Absolutely, and, and that's, actually, um, that's actually going on with closing the health gap right now, um, trying to make sure that we've got people that are, um, who are not a mobile, um, either because they don't have a car or they just can't get around themselves. But yes, that is being done through closing the health gap. Some very specific relationships that are um, that are in process right now um, to help do that. And especially, I think 
having um, the walk-in space for at the UCG and I has been helpful as well. And honestly, it has been um, evidence of the fact that UC really is trying to make sure that we remove as many barriers and we're looking at um, equity as opposed to just equality. Hi, Dr. Edgy. I just have a quick question. Um, you didn't speak about it much, but could you speak to um healthcare professionals and other public servants who may be hesitant about receiving the vaccine? Yes. Um, and perhaps way we could speak to our peers and colleagues to counsel them on it. I know a lot of people in the healthcare community are still hesitant about the vaccine, even though they might have some scientific knowledge and background of how it works. Yeah, so that is that is a tough one. And it's it's you know, it's um it's difficult because usually you're trying to bridge the gap in the science and here the science is not the barrier. Um, you know, I think um, Kaiser Family Foundation data is about 29% of healthcare workers. Now that data actually does roll in um, specifically folks who are in the, um, the nursing home environment. So your MAs and your nursing assistants and so forth um, that are very hesitant and heck no, you know, I'm never gonna get mine, et cetera, that I've heard. I, I you know, I work with some folks who, who've got that. Um, it, it's a tough situation. Uh, one of the things that did come up very, very early on was, is this gonna be mandated? Is this vaccine gonna be mandated? The reason we can't, of course, um, mandated at the health system level, like we have to mandate, you know, like we mandate the flu vaccine is because it's still under EUA. Um, so it's not, it's not fully FDA approved. As soon as it is, I am very, I'm very um, convinced that institutions will probably require it. Um, you know, the flu vaccine, I couldn't, I actually got a little note in my mailbox, Dr. Edgy, you haven't gotten your flu vaccine. Well, I didn't get my flu vaccine because I had just had my Moderna visit and we didn't know whether I got placebo or I got Moderna. And so in the trial, I actually had to give a 14 day buffer, um, you know, before I actually got, got a hold of that. But honestly, I think it's gonna probably get down to a mandate at some point in time. Um, number one, it's, most, it's more effective than, than any of the vaccines that we've ever had out there, I, not J and J. Um, but Jane Jay was, of course, um, tested in a completely different environment with some of the variants out there um, when Moderna and Pfizer weren't. But it's it's effective, it's safe, um, you know, it, it works. Zero deaths, zero hospitalizations with severe COVID. All of those things portend it even being more justified to be mandatory than um, the flu even. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I wish I had a, an absolute answer for that. That's a tough one. The other thing I, I think that has been a little bit difficult for me too is, you know, caring about my residents and fellows as much as I do. Number one, um, I always wanted to be the last one to get vaccinated, uh, especially since we had vaccine allocation as an issue at the very beginning. We're only getting 975 vaccines. Um, to our institution, and we were only one of 10 in the state and so on and so forth, and who gets the first vaccines. Um, so, so for me, it was a little bit, it was difficult, you know, to, to find out when I had my unblinding visit um, that I had actually gotten my vaccine before, you know, before my residents and fellows. But the thing that has been difficult is that it's public, you know, it's a, a protected health information whether they got vaccinated. So I really, we were relying on residents speaking to us and saying, hey, I got voluntarily saying they got their vaccine because we do want to be able to say, well, yep, we're gonna go ahead and potentially allow you to have your didactics, you know, masked and socially distanced with more than 10 people. But we really can't say that with good data if we don't know, okay, 97% of you have been vaccinated and you're gonna be in this room Plus, we have this Israeli study that says you're not transmitting. Yep, we can go ahead and have 40 in the room. So those are the decisions that have been a little harder to, you know, to address. Oh, one other thing I will say as well is that um, the fact that we had an unblinding visit so um, is also another tool I've been able to use when speaking to vaccine hesitant patients. Um, specifically, you know, when you think about um, the fact that the Tuskegee Institute trial or the Tuskegee experiment rolled on and on and on and, and nobody was any the wiser for 40 years. Um, the issue is that as soon as we found out that Moderna was 
effective or efficacious specifically and safe, they had to have us all on blind. And they had to give us the option of saying, yes, I want to stay in, in the trial, which I do. I will actually still stay on in the trial myself. Um, or whether you wanted to go ahead and if you didn't get it, get vaccinated now. Um, so, you know, again, I'm able to say to people, they actually stopped the trial and they they had to, by law, let us know, you know, um, that yes, we've got something here that's useful and helpful. Um, I'm staying in the trial for 25 months because my trying to squeeze every drop of information out of this um, benefit out of being in the trial is just trying to find out how long this immunity is conferred for. Um, so the full trial length is 25 months. And I suspect, well, at least by historically by vaccine, um, just history, is if there is good immunity um, at four months, the likelihood of you having good immunity lasting for a couple of years is fairly high. So I'm hopeful that, you know, we've already gone through four months for sure. I'm on, I think, Moderna trial day 183, I think is where I am right now. But we, you know, my vaccine, um, you know, I get eight vials of blood drawn every single time I go in. I've got seven full visits. Um, and my immune response has stayed robust all the way through. We suspect it will stay since it's, it's lasted four months. Thank you so much. Yeah, do the students have any other questions? But thank you so much for coming in, Dr. Edgy, um, for this insightful and personal talk. Um, I know I learned so much and I'm sure the students did as well. Um, it was very eye-opening. It's my absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. It's my privilege to be here today. Thank you. And students, uh, we will see you either Wednesday at the open discussion or next Monday um, at the usual time. So take care um, and everyone stay safe. Au revoir. Avec un bonjour.